Thank you, musicians, for that ministry tonight. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm just showing off because I never used to do up my jacket. <laughs> I was going to bring out my prize water bottle, but, uh, <laughs> but I'd better not. Matthew 16 is we we want to uh, to look at Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> Watchman Nee, uh, he writes these words. That strong self-assertive will of mine must go to the cross. And I must give myself over wholly to the Lord. We cannot expect a tailor to make us a coat if we do not give him any cloth, nor a builder to build a house if we let him have no building material. And in just the same way, we cannot expect the Lord to live out his life in us if we do not give him our lives in which to live without reservations, without controversy, we must give ourselves to him to do as he pleases with us. Part of building on your salvation is to allow God to work in you by giving him your all. And in our scripture, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, they test Jesus by asking for a sign from heaven, Jesus, he actually calls them hypocrites because of, the, uh, of leading people astray in their religious uh, ideas. And Jesus warns his disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, they were abusing their position as religious leaders by not giving the, uh, the proper teaching of the scriptures And uh, Jesus, in our text, which we're about to look at, uh, he presents a question on what people are actually thinking about him in in his day and age. And so we're going to look at that this evening in Matthew uh, 16. I'm going to look at verse number 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Can I say tonight that God wants to enlist as many people to help him build his church and if you are not enlisted tonight you are not currently on board with the vision of Jesus Christ can I say you can be tonight and I want to preach this evening uh, uh, on uh, on, uh, I will build my church and I want to look firstly at who do you say that I am because it's hard in this day and age to ignore who Jesus is And in our scripture, Jesus is asking his disciples, what are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? And I believe a lot of people in our world struggle today when it comes to answering this question, even though it is hard to ignore who Jesus is in our generation. Because you think about this tonight, Jesus is everywhere. You can see him uh, uh, on the, uh, his image on a, uh, on a, hanging on a wall. You can see murals that are painted on buildings, uh, building structures. There are crosses that are displayed on church steeples. There are large statues of Christ. You even have bumper stickers uh, saying, you know, honk uh, if you love Jesus. Uh, there are fish symbols. Uh, you know, uh, there are crucifixes, monuments, people even wearing T-shirts and and uh, caps and hoodies with Bible verses on them. You have Christians uh, even reading their Bibles on public transport. People, Christians on the streets sharing their faith, preaching boldly uh, on city street corners. There, There are flyers that are always being handed out. It's hard to ignore who Jesus is. And yet people cannot answer a simple question, who is Jesus to you? 
What does Jesus mean to you? I was looking at an article, the US students remain poor at history tests show. One headline on June the 14th, a recent federal test revealed only 20% of fourth graders were proficient in history. They could identify Abraham Lincoln, for example, but less than half could identify why he was important. Well, that's exactly the problem today and worldwide is so many people know of Jesus. They know about Jesus. They recognize his face. They hear his name, but they have no clue as to what he came to do for this world. You can ask, do you know of Jesus Christ? Some will say, yeah, Jesus was just a good man. He was a leader in his day and, uh, uh, who helped a lot of people. He was someone people looked to for influence. Uh, then there are those who like to think Jesus is what they think he should be to fit into their lifestyle. So you can see that there are people who know of Christ, uh, but they do not know the importance of why he came. And in our text, the disciples' reply to Jesus' question was, uh, well, Jesus, some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus goes on a step further and he says, okay, that's good to know what people are saying and what people are thinking. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? You know, half the struggle for unsaved people is them making their mind up about their belief in God. They cannot answer the question, who do you say that I am? Or what does Jesus mean to you? Are you going to heaven when you die? And the response often given is an opinionated response. Well, I believe all you need is to live a good life, keep doing right, and God will see the good in me. He'll let me into heaven, so don't bother me. I'm right. I don't need you Christians forcing on me what I know is true. And then they walk away oblivious to what they just said. You know, people are more confused today. In our text, Jesus mentions to Peter that the gates of hell shall not prevail. You know, the gates, in other words, is the assaults of hell will not prevail. And that's good to know as a Christian that hell doesn't have a chance when Christ is building his church through men and women that are getting saved. But the issue today is why are the unsaved people struggling to accept Jesus as their saviour? What is causing them to ignore Christ or be left confused about who he is and what he came for? Well, can I tell you? Yes, Pastor. Well, I'll tell you, the assault of hell is affecting the lost. It is affecting the unsaved. The assault of hell is affecting through religious people, through even churches. Matthew 23, 13 Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are, getting, uh, who are entering to go in. These religious rulers took advantage of their position for their own self-gain, and some people believed in what these religious leaders were doing, and others turned away from God altogether because of the way they did things. And this is one of the many reasons people, not, people cannot answer that question, who do you say that I am? The assaults of hell open the gates of confusion and intimidation. The assaults of hell open the gates of doubt and fear and unbelief and lies and deception People getting distracted, even the busyness of life are the gates of hell that flood the paths of those wanting to know Jesus Christ. That's why people resist and that's why people hold back on God. They are afraid that their friends and their family, will, what they would think of them if they were to follow Jesus Christ. Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? You know, one familiar answer is, I know who Jesus is. I know what he came to do. I know I'm a sinner. I know I have to repent and get my heart right. I know I'm going to hell. So what's the problem? Well, I can't let go of unforgiveness. I can't let go of the anger I have towards this person. I can't. Whatever it is that might be, 
Well, I'm sorry to say you don't know Jesus Christ at all, if that's your thinking. Let's look secondly at Christ builds his church for a moment. Someone said a church is not the building where people meet as a place of worship. It's not a cathedral with the grand steeple or the stained glass window. The church is not the place of historical icons or a crucified Christ. The church is the people who gather together and glorify the Lord. They come together to hear the word of God to find direction to the Father. God wants to build on your life. In our scripture, Matthew 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, You are blessed because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, or small rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You know, for numbers of people this evening, once they get a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, he begins to build on that revelation. For example, a decision to at the altar, this altar right here, to get saved is the answer to Jesus' question, you are accepting Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. And right there you become a building block, a living stone where Jesus can use your life as part of his building project, enlisted to help build the work of God because this is not a work of man. 1 Peter 2.5, as living stones being built up a spiritual house acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, it's refreshing to see and hear people get excited when they get saved. They ask questions or say, you know what, I want to follow Jesus like you follow Jesus. I want to have a relationship with God like you have a relationship with God. Because there, this is where the Holy Spirit begins to go to work. Because when a person gets a revelation of God, they begin to... Uh, want to know God more. Incrementally, their heart starts to change. They don't want that feeling of salvation to ever stop. You know, what did that prayer do to me? I remember making a phone call and the girl gets saved on the phone. What did you do to me? I didn't do nothing. God's doing something in your heart. Yeah, you know, they want to know more. They, they, they attend church service. They listen to sermons. They're being spiritually fed. Why? Because it's going to help them to grow. To grow. You know, where God can use their life to make a difference. You know, I remembered when I got saved, I never heard preaching like I've heard preaching in the Potter's House Church. I've never seen, I've seen people evangelizing. I'm thinking, what are they doing? I've never been part of a church that discipled men. I've never been part of a church family that has an interest in seeing me and my family live happy and have a successful and blessed future. I've never experienced the love of the church through Christ like this. Coming to church fills you up because Christ is involved. That you want to know more of who he is, that you want to have more, that you want to be a part of something more. And God changes you from the inside out. You actually want to get rid of the things that slow you down, the things that distract you because it helps your growth as a man of God and as a woman of God. You know, for most, most of us here today, when we got saved, you know know what God did in your life? Some of us stopped smoking. Some of us stopped drinking. Some of us stopped taking weed. Some of us stopped fooling around. Some of us got rid of some friends that wanted to take you out every weekend, get you wasted. You actually got a real job. But that doesn't happen through a 10-step program. That happens through the local church. Because we are all here today because of Christ building in you faith and strength and love and wisdom. And you get an enthusiasm. Oh, man, I just want to do something more for the kingdom of God. But that's how Christ builds his church. A church member writes, I think the church is right because it has taught me about Jesus Christ and him crucified. My church has taught me about the Bible. My church has given me faith. It has taught me how to pray. The church has taught me 
to appreciate all the good things which have been showered upon me. In my early youth, I believed that food and clothing and the luxuries of life were mine because I was alive. Now I know that God has given me these things because of his love. As a Christian, I like to know who has been good to me. The church has helped me find peace, so I am content, whatever my state may be. Church has continually influenced my life and always in the right direction. The church has given me friends, real friends. When all other friends forsook me because material resources had dwindled away, Away, The church continued to welcome me and I believe put just a little more warmth in their welcome than before. As I look back, I see the wonderful many things it has done for others. Countless thousands who have faith and hope and life today because of the church. And can I tell you, that's what Christ is building. He is building his church. So let's look thirdly at the keys of the kingdom tonight. What are the keys? And I know we hear quite often, what are the keys to revival? What are the keys to a better marriage? What's the key to success? What's the keys to dominion or even having breakthrough in ministry? People ask, what is the key to a better future? Well, in our scripture, let's have a look. It says in uh, Matthew 16, On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here is Jesus. He tells Peter because of the revelation that God gave him, I'm giving you authority to proclaim and preach the gospel. That whatever you loose, whatever you get a hold of, whoever you minister to, those who latch on to the truth of the gospel, whatever you permit here on earth will be loosed in heaven. They will receive the promises of God because of their faith to obey and receive Christ as their Savior. And whatever you bind on earth, or in other words, whatever you prohibit, whoever does not receive the truth, those who reject Christ, who try to get into the kingdom through their own way, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven because there is no place for pride. And as some commentaries tell us, Peter is given the keys of authority to admit entrance into the kingdom through preaching the gospel. But can I also say it's not just subject to Peter, it's for all who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I got saved, you are given authority through Jesus Christ. The gates of hell will not prevail. Hell itself cannot stop the believer from proclaiming the gospel because authority takes you to another level. In our scripture, Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven and this is what he did with those keys. He took authority. Acts chapter 2, Peter is dealing with some people uh, that have abused God's house, the church, and other believers. It says in Acts 2, 38 to 41, Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. We read also in Acts chapter 8, the apostle Philip, he is a disciple. He was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Verses 5 to 8 in Acts chapter, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, paralyzed, lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. We read of Cornelius and his household getting saved as Peter was still preaching. In Acts 10, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. I tell you, God or Christ is building his church and that's how he builds his church. How? Through you. You know, part of our DNA as a fellowship, and we state this with the utmost confidence, is to have authority is to come under authority. Because without authority, how can God use your life? 
You have been given the same keys of the kingdom as Peter, as the disciples. And the Bible says you've been given authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. And uh, you know, they, they shall by no means hurt you. In other words, uh, you have dominion over those who try to rip you off or poison you with accusations. You know, God gives you authority as well to pray for the sick. You are those who are emotionally unstable. You have the authority to cast out demons. You have the authority to speak life into dead situations. For example, tonight we have a baptism. There there are going to be people taking dominion over the old life, having authority over the flesh. This is how Christ builds his church on genuine souls who know that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. They're making a commitment to follow Christ. Verse 18 of our scripture says, I also say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Can I say, fire from hell can explode, hot lava can flood your path, the storms from the pit of hell can beat down on you as God's people, but it's not going to make a difference to the person who builds his or her life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is our authority. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the rock on which we stand. He is the rock, our rock and fortress. So when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, hell doesn't stand a chance. I want to close with this illustration. I'm not going to take credit for this illustration. I actually... Uh, uh, received or got this from one of Pastor Richard Ruby's sermons this week and I just thought this would be a great closing. <clears throat> it was of a Japanese soldier, Mitsushui Fujita, uh, gave the orders to invade <clears throat> or pretty much start the Second World War and invade Pearl Harbor. This man became a high-ranking officer But when they lost the war to the Americans, he hated America and uh, because he believed that the Americans were cruel and that uh, they would humiliate the Japanese because of the loss of the war. One day he went to the prison where they kept political prisoners. This is in Japan uh, where the Americans had taken over. But he goes to the prison because he wanted the prisoners to share in his bitterness and his anger towards the American people. But when he arrived to see his friends, he was shocked because they weren't bitter. They were different. They were relaxed. He said, what is wrong with you? These Americans, they are humiliating us. And they said, no, no, we're being treated really well here. They're looking after us. He couldn't believe the change in these prisoners. And they mentioned this one particular person It was an 18-year-old girl who was so kind and taking care of the prisoners. She had won their hearts over and he couldn't understand why. And they asked her, why are you being so kind? And she said to the Japanese soldiers, "Uh, well, I'm kind because uh, Japanese soldiers killed my parents. They had a hard time coming to terms with this. And the story goes when she was a little girl, Her whole family were in Japan as missionaries before the war. And when things started to heat up in Japan, the war was was on the verge. The parents were there. They were there for some time. And when the daughter was 18 years old, they sent her back to the States. But then the parents were accused of being spies. And they were going, the Japanese were going to kill them. They asked for 30 minutes of prayer. Can we pray for 30 minutes? They prayed for 30 minutes And straight after that, uh, they were beheaded. The 18-year-old daughter found out about it, and she hated the Japanese. But then she began to pray, and she asked God, what did her parents pray about? And God revealed that they had a heart for the Japanese. And so she volunteered to go to the Japanese prison so that she could serve those men and tell them about Jesus Christ. Mitsushoi Fujeta was so shocked, uh, he couldn't believe. He was confused. He just, you know, Christianity, Jesus, he's walking away from this. And uh, as he was walking away, he sees this flyer. It's a flyer of a U.S. prisoner of war that was actually speaking 
at a meeting that week. Mr. Shoy Fujeta actually went to that meeting. He heard the gospel and uh, he gets saved and he ends up becoming an evangelist. And he spent the rest of his life preaching the gospel to the Japanese people. Why? Because he didn't know who Jesus was. But because Christ is building his church, here was an 18-year-old girl who, who, who set an example to Japanese prison, and he sees this, and he gets to know who Jesus Christ is. Can I tell you, that's how Christ enlists people into his church, right? Because in the end, it's, it, it gets people enlisted in his church and draws them closer to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's bow our heads this evening, close our eyes. Um, I want to bring an invitation this evening of salvation. But before I do that, if you are getting baptized, um, you can uh, be dismissed and, and get ready. But before, I want to bring this invitation firstly of salvation. I preached a simple sermon on Christ building his church. How Jesus Christ actually reaches out to you and I. The Bible says that we've all sinned. We're not perfect people. We've all done wrong. We've all made mistakes. We all say things and do things that are go against the grain, in other words. But can I tell you, the Bible says that we've all sinned and we all fall short of God's glory. We are one step away from entering heaven, but what stops us from entering heaven is our sin. Sin is what separates you and I from a heavenly father. Our sin. Doesn't matter what kind of sin it is, whether it's lying, killing, cheating, stealing, whatever it might be, sin. And this evening, the consequence of our sin is what sin does is it sends us to hell. The everlasting, the Bible says the everlasting, it's a lake of fire. That's where our sin, our sin is sending us. But tonight, you don't have to go here because the good news is that God sent us a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ paid the price for your sins. And you can be sitting here right now and your heart is beating. You know what? My heart's not right. My heart's, I'm a sinner. But Jesus said, well, no, I, 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 paid, I paid for your sin. All you have to do is believe in me, Jesus says. Believe in me and I can forgive you of your sins. I can set you free. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. Why? Because his blood was shed for your sins. Instead of you being on the cross, Jesus took your place. And the Bible says, and this is, the, this is the good part, is that when you receive Christ, when you accept him, the Bible says, heaven is your home. Your name is written in heaven. Tonight, your heart is not right with Jesus Christ. And you would like to get it right tonight, uh, this evening. All you have to do is do one thing. Just quickly raise your hand where I can see it. Uh, and you can know the love of Jesus Christ. You can know Jesus Christ personally right now tonight. Uh, how many are there tonight? Just quickly raise your hand. Just put it up where I can see it. Uh, we'll pray. You can receive Jesus Christ. How many are there this evening? Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Well, tonight you can say you are the son of the living God. You can respond and you can say, yes, that's me. Lord, you are the son of the living God and I want to get my heart right, right now, tonight. Just quickly, raise your hand tonight where I can see it and we'll pray with you this evening. Backslider. You once had a relationship with Jesus Christ. You were going to church or maybe you're just lukewarm or casual Listen, you can recommit tonight. Jesus loves you just as much. Just quickly raise your hand where I can see it. Backslider, unsaved or backslider, you want to give your heart to Christ. Just quickly raise your hand. Put it back down and we'll pray together. Okay, I'm going to change the call for a moment. Before I open up the altar this evening, I, you know, tonight... We just heard a sermon on Christ building His church. And I, you know, this morning we heard about fruitfulness. 
Well, that's part of what Jesus is saying in our scripture this evening. He says, I will build my church. He gives us the keys that we need, the keys of authority to have dominion in our walk, to have authority in our homes, to have authority over our marriages, in our workplaces, to have authority in ministry and leadership. It's these areas that not only help you advance in life, but also others that look to you will see, listen, uh, their life makes a difference. I want what they have because Christ builds his church, not only through you, but through those that are seeing you and watching you. Because you never know this evening the impact that you can make in someone's life who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Just like Mitsushoi Fujita, he did not know who Christ was. And then he becomes an evangelist and preaches to his own people until the day he died. That's how Christ can build his church. Christ can build his church through you this evening. I want to open up the altar tonight. Um, come and lay hold of God. And God can help you this evening. Thank you, Jesus. sing tonight authority flows from his throne unto his own his anthem raised so exalt lift up on high the name of Jesus give God praise tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord God. We magnify your name. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. You can all uh, take your seats tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Brother Kit Plummer. And um, we're going to have a baptism this evening. Amen. As we find our seats, uh, we, thank, we thank God for all those who've chosen to follow Christ and be baptized today. Uh, baptism, firstly, is not salvation. Uh, you get saved when you repent of your sins and receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Uh, baptism is an outward and public declaration of your faith as a step of obedience in following Christ. Jesus commanded us in Matthew 28 verse 19 to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Baptism is a representation of the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and allows us to identify ourselves with him and it also represents the death to our old life um, uh, of sin that occurred when we repented and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and, and Savior. The water in which we are immersed is symbolic of the grave and it indicates that, um, that you died to your sin and are buried with Christ and as you rise from the water it signifies that you are a new creation rising to the newness of life in Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so by their faith in, and obedience, we'll baptize these saints. Let's uh, welcome the first one as he comes. Hi church, I'm Paul. Um, I'm getting baptised today to recommit, to, to be for real this time, to, to commit myself to kill my old self dead and to be born new. Um, I got baptised last year with my brother Saul and today he's baptising me, praise God. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's it. Praise God, let's go, come on. of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Hey church, uh, I'm Kian. I go by Kenny. Uh, I used to be a Catholic. Uh, my life was not right with God and uh, I just got saved last two weeks and uh, you know I wanted to give my life to Christ for real and you know commit myself to Christ and you know um, just trying to change my life and I just want to get to know God more and bring more people to church and change their life as well. Thank you so much. Let's go. Come on. By the confession of your faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. King of kings and Lord of lords, we're going to shout it on the streets. And he is the King of standing. kings, God King of kings, kings and Lord of lords, we're going to Church, Father, we give you glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, my God. 
Amen. Very precious to see people being baptized. And uh, we believe God for you, Paul. God's going to do a great work for you, Kenny. We're very excited uh, what God wants to do in your life. Amen. We're going to dismiss on that note. God bless you. Good night.